So as we begin this new year, we want to continue our focus on the concept of transformation. And uh, to help us with this process, I want you to think back to a, a recent series that we did called Renovation of the Heart. And over the next couple of weeks, what I want to do, is two or three weeks here, um, is just do a quick review uh, coupled with some additional challenges for us. Uh, and what this is going to do is help us lay the groundwork, really, and build on this foundation that we have uh, preparing us for our next series, which is titled Change Your Mind. And what we're going to do is talk about the process of the mind, the role that the mind plays in this process of uh, transformation. And so I would encourage you to go to our website, and uh, the, all the, uh, that series is actually on the website. You can watch the videos from that, uh, just to remind you of some of the things that we covered. Uh, it was a lot of stuff, and it was a lot to think about. And so uh, for, that, for that reason, I know that some of you won't have necessarily have the time, and let's be honest, some of you just don't want to, which is fine. That's why we're going to do a little review of some of the things that we covered um, just to help stir our memory uh, just a bit of some of the things that we have already done. Now, uh, I need to mention right off the bat, when we start talking about things like this, we start talking about... And it's, <sighs> It seems to be the case that we, we, we stress out over this concept of works and, and salvation and, and, and faith. And anytime we start talking about things that we have to do or things that we should do, we begin to kind of maybe, I don't know, sometimes we just get a little bit confused. In fact, you may begin to tell yourself or you may begin to say things like, well, it sounds like works. Or it sounds like you're saying we are saved by works. Or it sounds like you're saying that I have to work my way into heaven. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, we got to get this, I just say this right up front. The only reason anyone is able to be saved is because of God's mercy, period. There's nothing you have done to earn that mercy. There's nothing you can do to earn that mercy. There's nothing, there's, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing. In fact, God has cast his mercy, as it were. He has offered his mercy, has presented his mercy, gives his mercy to all of mankind. However, it is up to us to choose whether or not we actually cooperate with that mercy or we don't cooperate with that mercy. Let, let me give it to you this way. As an example, let's say that you want to take in the benefits of being in the sun. Do you agree that there's some benefits of being in the sun? Yes. Vitamin D, maybe... Maybe you just want a suntan. For some people, that's a benefit, right? Whatever the case is, let's say you want the benefits of the sun. The sun that it shines upon the whole world. In order to participate, or cooperate, to obtain the benefits of being in the sun, what do you have to do? You got to go outside and you got to get in the sun, right? Staying inside... It's not going to re you're not going to reap the benefits of the sun. You have to go outside to reap the benefits of the sun. Now, here's the thing. When you're out in the sun and you get the benefits, the vitamin D, the tan, that's, just, that's what everybody wants, right? When you get the tan, you're not going to say, I earned this tan. Well, some of you might. <laughs> you haven't done anything to earn the tan. You haven't done anything to earn the benefits of the sun. All you've done is stand there. The benefits are there regardless if you're out there or not. What you got to do is go stand in the stream of the sun in order to reap the benefits of the sun. Well, here's the thing. God's mercy, <laughs> it shines out upon all of mankind, and we choose whether or not we're going to actually cooperate with it or not. And here's the thing about transformation that you need to get. It is God who does the work. It is God who does the work, but we have to open up ourselves to allow it to happen. He doesn't do anything by force. Sometimes I wish he did, but he knows the benefit of not doing that. And so that's what this is all about. When you hear, start hearing things about things that we need to do, uh, don't allow yourself to get confused about all of this. God offers it to us. It's up for us to cooperate with him. We have to, we said this in the very beginning of our, our talk concerning this. We have to be willing to work with God the way that he has said. He gives us what we want. We either open ourselves up to him or we close ourselves up. Throughout Jesus' ministry, what you'll see is that things were hidden and things were revealed. Everyone saw the same thing. 
Some opened their eyes, some believed, and some followed. And some didn't. And that's where we stand today at the crossroads. And so as we consider this concept of transformation, I think we have to first paint a picture of what we're being transfer, transformed into. And in order to see that, there is this reality that is presented to us. We call it, some call it a kingdom reality. Some call it this new life that Jesus came to give us. We, I just say, look, this is the way that it's supposed to be, or it should be for Christians, for people who are trying to follow Jesus. This is, the, this is what we're working towards, working to become. This is what it means. This is what it looks like to be christ like. And so when you open up New Testament and our minds are absorbed in one of those letters, let's say it's the, uh, the letter to the Ephesians, or maybe my favorite is uh, First Peter. What you're looking at when you read that, and sometimes that you feel like there's a distance there, and we're not just talking about culturally or time. You see that there's this distance in reality. When you see that, right, that's what we're talking about. When you look into that and your mind's absorbed in that, you begin to, you might begin to see some sense of distance there, like I don't experience this, or this isn't my life, or this isn't what my, my life looks like. Or some of us, most of us, probably say, wow, look at, how, how, look at my shortcomings, look how often I fail. Right? That's typically where our, our mind uh, tends to go. But when we look at that, what you're seeing is literally, and there's no, other, there's no better way to describe it than you're looking at a divine world, a divine life, a divine reality. There's no other way to put it. In fact, I think I prefer that language because what it does is it, it separates. It shows us a clear distinction between the life of a, uh, lived from a broken heart and the life lived from a restored heart. We're talking about transformation. And that's what we see when we look. We're looking at a divine world and a divine life. And we choose whether or not to enter into that divine world or that divine life by giving ourselves to Jesus. And Jesus said in John 4, those who give him themselves to him will receive, notice, living water. Now, when we look at that context and you go to John chapter 7, you understand when Jesus talks about living water, he's literally talking about the spirit, the spirit of God that is within us. He says that we receive living water, and as a result, it will keep us from what? Ever thirsting again. That is, being driven and ruled by unsatisfied desires. You fast forward to John 7, 38. He says, indeed, they will receive rivers of living water flowing from the center of their life to a what? Thirsty world and so we're impacted and then therefore as a result the light shines this is another way that the bible describes this the world the influence that we have we're impacting the people that are around us we're, we're so satisfied that we're overflowing and as a result people begin to begin to taste what this satisfying life is like they get a glimpse of it, they begin to see it and as, as a result we pour ourselves or god pours himself through us out into those that are around us. That's the picture that Jesus paints. That's one of the pictures that Jesus paints. Paul paints another picture because he understood the reality. Notice what he says in Ephesians chapter three. Paul prayed that believers will know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that they may be filled with all the fullness of God by the power at work within us that it is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. Why would Paul say he prayed that? Because he knew of the reality that exists. He knew that this could be a possibility. And I would dare say that Paul himself probably tasted this as well. He understood that it was a possibility. And he desired that this would become a reality for others. Peter said this in 1 Peter, this letter that he writes. Peter said that those who love and trust in Jesus will, quote, rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. That's chapter 1, verse 8. Then with genuine mutual love pouring from their hearts. Verse 22 of the same chapter. Ridding themselves of all malice and guile and insincerity, envy and all slander. That's chapter 2, verse 1. Then he said that those believers would silence scoffers of the way of Christ by simply doing what is right. Chapter 2, verse 15. And by casting all of their anxieties upon God because he cares for us. That's chapter 5. In verse 7, what you need to understand is that ordinary people entered into this divine world, this divine life, this divine reality. Ordinary people entered in this, lived within this during the days of Jesus, during the days of the New Testament, and in times since. We have examples of this all around us. We just have to open up our eyes to it. I see glimpses of this myself, even among people here at North Point, and that shouldn't be a surprise to you because we're the church. 
It's what happens. Whether you recognize it or realize it, it's happening. You're being transformed one way or the other. We're just trying to point it out. We're just trying to bring it to the surface so that we can better cooperate with God as he does this work within us. I tell you of a recent situation where I see, I see a glimpse of someone who recognizes, who is living, I believe, living in this reality. I'm going to say some things about someone, and I'm only going to say them because they're not here. That sounded bad. But it's good, because they wouldn't want me to say this. If you're, if you're aware of the situation here, we have a family uh, in the Sloans, Jeannie and Hiram Sloan. They've been through really, really rough time lately. Really, really rough time. Hiram had a massive uh, stroke. And in the process, Jeannie fell and fractured her ankle and her knee. And on top of that, one of her, her, her daughter, who was helping take care of them, has cancer and is going through treatments and so forth. Just recently had surgery. I believe she had a chemo Friday. Now, if you would look at that situation, we would all say, oh, my goodness. This is horrible. How could anyone go through this? And we would begin to have some sense of pity for them, rightly so. Maybe even a sense of empathy, at the very least sympathy, right, for what they're going through. It's, it's, it's a bad situation. From all, all perspectives, it seems like it is. If you had the chance to sit down and talk with her, you would see something different. As I sat across from her and she was explaining to me where she was, and what was going on, it was actually a breath of fresh air for me. Helping them deal with their issues was a breath of fresh air, comparatively speaking to lots of the other issues that we have to deal with in life. You say, how is that the case? Because in the way that she saw her issues, in the way that she was dealing with their problems, which are many, I was looking into the face of someone who understands the power of God, who is living in the presence of God, whose heart has been transformed, and she is living in a divine reality. Because none of the things that she is dealing with, none of the things that they're dealing with, are going to shake her. In fact, they have caused her faith and her trust in God to go so... I remember sitting there listening to her thinking, I hope that, Lord willing, if I lift, and this is not a knock on her age, I am not talking about how old somebody <laughs> is, I... I have learned my lesson <laughs> until somebody tells me something about being a young pup, then it's on again. <laughs> I remember, I, I thought, I hope that whenever I am her age, if Lord willing I live that long, that I can have her perspective. It was like looking, we, we, it was like looking into someone who, got, uh, someone who got something and you wished you had it. We see glimpses of that. You may even know people in your own life who were that way. Maybe you know of experience, experience uh, things with people who were that way. But the problem is, is oftentimes what we experience with people is not that. And I told her, I said, I wish that people who are less serious situations than you could see how God is working in this situation and in their life. Yeah, I had a chance to talk to her, and when they get out, uh, if, if Lord willing, they'll be up here, and they'll, they'll be telling the story. It's an amazing testimony to transformation that takes place in our lives. Our eyes become open to the things that God is doing in the here and now, not looking behind. So we, we see this reality. We get glimpses of it, okay? But the goal is here, the, the, the issue is here is that we ourselves aren't living in that, oftentimes, we have to open up our eyes to uh, this uh, reality. Now, here, here's the thing. When, we, when we, we look at Scripture, we look at those things that maybe we read that Jesus talks about, maybe the things that Paul mentioned here or, or Peter, when we, we look at these things, and we oftentimes say things like this. When somebody messes up or when we mess up, what do we say? Nobody's perfect, right? That's the first thing. Nobody's perfect. I'm, nobody has to tell you that nobody's perfect, Right? 
You know you're not perfect, and nobody else knows. Everybody else knows that they're not perfect. Now, sometimes we may forget that, I get it, but that's the first thing that comes out of our mind. And I think it's indicative of where we are and how we perceive ourselves and what the possibilities are. We immediately say nobody's perfect when we fail or when somebody else fails. But here, here's the question What about when we read things like this? That when we read about being freed from all malice and all guile and all insincerity and envy and all slander, what comes to your mind? is the first thing is, well, we may read this and begin immediately to focus on our own inadequacies and our own shortcomings. Mean, we see them like, well, that's in my life. I'm not freed from that. And that may be the first thing that, that we go to. We start to focus on our own shortcomings and we begin to feel inadequate. But when we read this, let's, let's not just immediately focus on our own shortcomings. Instead, when we read this, let us dwell and meditate on the possibilities, on this really divine reality. That can become ours. Think about it. If the first thing you think is, that's not possible, it never will become possible. It never will become a reality. I see it all the time with people who who become what we would call successful. Nobodies, we would consider them nobody, just, just everyday people. All of a sudden, one day say, you know what, this can be a reality, and I'm going to do this. And as a result, they do all sorts of things, start businesses, start companies. They rise to the top. They do all sorts of things that describe what we describe as being successful. It happens all the time. I follow several people who have done that very young. We're talking in early 20s who are millionaires because one day they said, you know what, I think this is possible. I can do this. When most people said, that's stupid, that's impossible, you can't do this, it can't be accomplished. Now maybe that's a poor example because our success is not measured on how much money we have. But at the same time, the perspective, the analogy is there. If you constantly look at this and say, that's not me, I can't never do this, this is not possible, then it never will be. Then it never will be. So instead of reading these things and begin, all of a sudden we just come to this place where we say, well, that's just not me, and that'll never be me, and then we pass over and we move, we move on. Or we sit there in despair thinking, I'll never get this, I'll never figure it out. But instead of firstly, and I know it's hard and you've got to fight against it, but instead of first going to that place saying, this can never be me, what do we need to do? We need to sit there, and I think first we need to dwell on, wow, that is a possibility. Either you believe it or not, <laughs> where's your faith? It's either possible or if it isn't. And if it ain't possible, then why is Paul praying this stuff? Why is Jesus saying this? Why is Peter? Why is any of this stuff in the New Testament if it's not possible? Where's your faith? That's where maybe you need to start. So when we read this, the first thing we need to do is maybe dwell on the possibilities. Like, wait a minute. You're telling me that if someone like Paul could become who he was, I wonder what's possible with somebody like me. Because I ain't half as bad as he was. Right? That's the rea- and that's the reality that we need to live. So I'm telling you, we need to begin to change and shift our perspective. And, so, and in doing so, lingering on the beauty that is being presented there, of the character of, of the life, of, of what it means to, to live under the reign and rule of, of God each and every day. That's what that is. Being a citizen of the kingdom, that's what that is. And so I think we need to linger on the beauty and the reality that's being presented to us And it's a reality that can become ours. And I'm suggesting that if we, by shifting our perceptions, it'll help it become a reality. Don't say it can't be so. Because when we do that, we're showing a lack of trust and confidence. And with many people, we need to pray, Lord, increase my faith. And so we need to linger on this reality. And so let's just try and actually do what Paul said, Philippians 4, 8. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And, and some of these phrases, the things that the, the, this life is being presented in the gospel, this life is presented in, in, in scripture, that is, that is exactly what that is. Praiseworthy. Something that is excellent. The, look, at, look what Paul Look what Paul says here. He says, listen, you need to think on, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. And This describes this life. This life that Jesus came to give us. A life that we say ain't possible. But I'm telling you that I believe it is because I've seen it. I've seen some of it in my own life. Now, I do have a long way to go, as most people, hopefully. But I have seen it. And I believe that it's possible. 
Because Jesus said that it was, and his disciples said that it was, because they, as ordinary men and women, lived in that reality. And so, this is what I want us to do today, uh, with our remaining of our, our time together here. I want us to practice this, this, this fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about those things that are excellent and worthy of praise. We're going to do that for the rest of the remaining of our time here uh, together uh, today. And so, I want to go through some things that Scripture says, okay? And I want us to think about the concepts and what it would be like. The, the, the possibility of this actually being a reality. Uh, maybe, maybe you'll think of uh, an instance in which you had uh, experienced these things, experienced uh, things with people where these phrases can describe them. Right? Or, maybe, or maybe, maybe these are things that you've experienced uh, yourself. Maybe, maybe this is, this, these are some of the things that you do experience and so I hope even through that that you'll be filled with, with joy. Now, as soon as we start doing this, again, as I mentioned earlier, the danger is that we immediately, we immediately focus on our own shortcomings. If I mention a phrase that is a possibility, one of the first things our mind says, well, it's a possibility because it's not a reality for me, right? We have to fight against that. Duh, we know that it's not a reality. That's why we're thinking about it. That's why we're focused on it. But just because it's not a reality doesn't mean it can't become a reality. Many people never would have thought I would be standing here today. There's even some people in here who never thought I'd be standing here. <laughs> but I am. It is a reality. And that's what we have to focus on. We've got to get our minds into that place. So you've got to fight against that. And if nothing else... If nothing else, if you have a hard time saying, getting, getting away from the negative self-talk that you tell yourself that you're a failure, that this is not you, that you don't experience it in your life, what is wrong with you? Well, we can talk about that later, but what is really going on with me? Why is this not a reality? you got to fight against that. And if nothing else, just, just maybe meditate in awe of the possibility that, well, if Jesus said it, then gotta be so right like it has to be true so if nothing else at least do that so i'm, I'm gonna throw out some phrases here now i want to encourage you to assume whatever posture that you need to assume okay some of you are this is my time to go to sleep some of you just just whatever it is if you need to close your eyes if whatever it is that you need to do i want you to put yourself in a place mentally okay where i'm gonna say some phrases some things that are possibilities and literally this is it <laughs> This isn't a magic formula, okay? Um, I, I'll say this because this is relatable to me at least, and maybe you'll get it. Uh, there is a, a, in, a pro bodybuilder from the UK who, uh, a lot of people who are in, in athletics and bodybuilding and shows and aesthetics and things like that, um, we'll go to these conferences or these, these talks where they're trying to get these secrets from these guys who kind of made it to the top, okay? And um, I, <laughs> so they're all gathered in this, this place and they're all waiting for this guy to come out on stage and give them his, he was, he was a pro bodybuilder, he reached new heights for his day and time. Uh, there a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of people would say he did a lot of great things for, uh, for the sport and uh, they're waiting to see, okay, so what's the secret formula? Like, how'd you do it? And he gets up on stage and he disappoints everybody because he says, well, I put 135 on the, on the bar and I squat 20 reps. Then I put 185 on the bar and I squat 20 reps. Then I put 225 on the bar and I squat 20 reps. It says, and then I do my working set and I put 500 on the bar. Now they're waiting for some technique. They're waiting for something special. It's like, no, look, nothing has changed. <laughs> it's just your basic stuff. Okay. But you got to open your eyes to the reality, the possibility that it's right there in front of you. And it can't become, all you have to do is open yourself up to it. You've got to put in the work. There's that work. You've got to stand in the sun. It's not enough just to look from the distance at the possibilities. You've got to stand in the sun. And so, first of all, we need to look at this. And so, there's a couple of phrases here that I'm going to read to you, okay? And, and I, would, I would suggest that take out your device and type these in. Or if there's something, one of them that really hits you where, you know, this is something you really need to focus on. You really need to begin to think about the reality of this. Uh, you write that down, and your challenge is, is to every day look at that and just take five minutes. I think you need more, but take at least five minutes to think about the reality. Like, 
not just about that fact that it's not a reality in your own life, but that it can become one, and maybe what that would look like. Right? Or just be amazed at the reality that this is before me, and I, I could live in it. And so think about some of the phrases that are, are mentioned here. When Paul says that it is possible for us to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Think about that. To know the love of Christ. We're talking about knowing something beyond just quoting 1 Corinthians 13. Beyond just knowing the story. Coming to understand something that is beyond knowledge. Learn it. Imagine what that would be like. Imagine how it would just change our perspectives. The fact that it's a possibility. I can just imagine how it would change my outlook and how I dealt with other people, even how I saw other people. I think, I think then you begin to see people the way that God sees them. Then you really get a taste of what it means when it says God is love. Like knowing the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's almost indescribable. I, I think it's great to just think about that. I think we should... I love, I love what Craig said during communion. It, it, what it brought to my mind was this idea that eagerly, when Jesus said, I'm, I was eager to, to do this with you, and I thought, well, we should all be really eager to come together. We should all be really, I think we should be really eager to, 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 to come to understand, to know the love of Christ that surpasses. I think, I think this, we should be eager for this to become a reality in our lives. But you got to get it that it doesn't just happen sitting back in your recliner watching the Cowboys win or lose. What about another phrase? And this is, this is one I love to wrestle with. To be filled with all the fullness of God. What would it be like to be filled with the fullness of something? Like, what does that even mean? That's what you need to think about. What does that mean? What does it mean to be filled with the fullness of God? The fact that that's a reality. Not just the fact that we haven't reached it, but the fact that that is a reality. To be filled with all the fullness of God. That's a possibility. What about when Scripture says that there's a power at work within us? We sang about that this morning. It's a power at work within us. When I, I read that, I immediately think of Ephesians 4, or excuse me, the letter to the Ephesians. There's a power at work within us. There are things that are happening that we don't even realize. And through our faithfulness with God, there's a work going on in us that is impacting this world. You may think it's in a small way and others may see it in a big way, but regardless, it's the work that God has designed for you. Then there's this work within us that is transforming us day to day to the image of his son if we're opening up ourselves to that. What about the reality that God is able to accomplish abundantly for more than all we can ask or imagine? You believe that? Or do we sit back just really snarky, thinking, you know, it's good biblical language. It's either real or it's not. You either believe it or you don't. For those who believe it, that's kind of exciting. I mean, you can do a whole lot more than I ever thought. He's already thought of it, right? It's already in work. 
He's able to accomplish abundantly four more than all we can ask or imagine. Man, we believe that. When Jesus says, hey, don't worry about X, Y, and Z, if we believe this, we wouldn't worry about X, Y, and Z, would we? I love he is able to accomplish abundantly for more than we all can ask or imagine. And some realities he already has. He already has. What about this one? He says, listen, <laughs> rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. <laughs> Usually that happens whenever, you know, the Cowboys win, right? Or Cowboys lose. I, I root for the Cowboys, too. In fact, you know, if y'all go to the Super Bowl, I'll wear a Cowboys jersey, but you got to purchase, you got to buy it. <laughs> I can't. I would be disowned if I bought that. But I'll wear it. I'll wear it extra large, so just keep that in mind. If y'all go to the Super Bowl, I'll wear one. <laughs> See this rejoicing and this joy? That rejoicing and joy, there's nothing, nothing that does, nothing, that even, even us having fun does not even begin to describe the amount of joy that, the joy that we can have in Christ. And part of the joy we have is because of the joy we have in Christ, right? But what if when the Cowboys are losing and the Saints are winning? I mean, what you going to do then? If our joy is based on those things, it's not really joy, is it? So, Rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Imagine if, we, if this described us. What would people say? Oh, what about this one? What if there was genuine, 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 mutual, genuine, mutual love? Pouring from our hearts. Pouring. Not just a pouring from our hearts. Genuine mutual love pouring from our hearts. I see that. I see this. <laughs> what about the reality of getting rid of all evil behavior? That's a tough one. Getting rid of all evil behavior. And part of the reasons why we feel, we feel I, gotta, I gotta say this, part of the reason why we feel like we can't do this is because we know, it's, it's because of the brokenness of our heart. It's because we're coming out of a broken state of a heart where that needs to be restored. When you're in a state of despair, all you're gonna see is despair and the impossibilities. This is where our faith comes in. To get rid of all evil behavior, be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. I believe this is a reality. I believe it can be a reality. I don't know why it would be presented to us if it could not be. In fact, I've seen glimpses of this in people people that I've known and I would say have known them pretty intimately what if this was a reality and the fact that it could be a reality we could stop being beating ourselves up and being burdened by this sense of jealousy that we have for people hypocrisy not having to hide behind Whatever facade that we paint for the world. Like, really being able to become transparent. That's scary. But that's a possibility. Getting rid of all deceit and unkind 
speech. That looks like a very daunting task. But instead of looking at that as something that's not accomplishable, let's look at that as something that can become a reality. And one of the reasons why I think we feel like it can't become a reality is because we know ourselves. And we're depending upon our own selves to do the work. We're thinking that we're, we're, it's, it's all up to us. We're going to accomplish this just by our own efforts. It's God who's doing the work in us. We're just choosing whether or not we're going to cooperate. That alone tells me anything is possible. Scripture even says, right? All things are possible with God. If it's possible for Jew and Gentile to become one, this is possible. Because these are some of the things that they would have had to deal with. And they overcame them. And it became a reality. And it's never too late. I do believe that the older we get, the more challenging it does become. Because typically the more baggage we have. Which is why Solomon says, listen, <laughs> pay attention to what your mom and daddy say. Pay attention to these precepts. Pay attention to the commands. Pay attention to all of these things. And in doing so, guard your heart for all that flows the issues of life. Some of us are starting later than others. But it's never too late. The question is, do you believe that there's a power at work within you that can do four more greater things than you can ever hope or imagine? And if so, these can become a reality in your life.